And I turned to the forest itself uh, for a model of sustainability. You're looking there at the most productive ecosystem on the planet. Uh, this is actually a watercolor by my friend, Tony Foster, done in Costa Rica. And that ecosystem achieves its productivity on what are probably among the poorest soils on the planet. And there's a very good set of questions to be answered there. So that's been a long-standing question, but my name, at least, is Adam Sachs, and I'm the Executive Director of Biodiversity for a Livable Climate, which is collaborating with GBH Forum Network on this speaker series of Life Saves the Planet. So I'll give you a brief introduction to the two speakers, and then we'll take it away. Um, Inga Foundation founder and director, Mike Hans, has been working to halt the destruction of the rainforest for over 20 years. He's an experienced tropical ecologist and scientific researcher. Mike divides his time between his farm in Cornwall, Cornwall in the UK and the Inga Foundation's chief project, the Land for Life Project in Honduras. Ratan Lal is a soil scientist, one of the leading soil scientists in, in the world, and his work is focusing on regenerative agriculture through which soil can help resolve global issues such as climate change, food security, and water quality. So I now welcome you to this talk. Please put your questions in the Q&A and pay close attention to this excellent package of important ideas, both about soils in general and Mike's project in Honduras. Well, hello. Um, I'm uh, Mike Hans. Uh, I'm, I'm a a tropical ecologist and uh, for many years was uh, a research uh, associate in the University of Cambridge but based in Central America researching the ecology of slash and burn agriculture and of course as, as you can probably all imagine the ecology of any possible sustainable alternative to the practice of slash and burn. Um, Annie if I could have the first slide please. There we go. Um, and then what I'm, going to, what I'm going to present to you is, I'll try and make it a brief overview of the, uh, the, the Cambridge project that began in uh, 1986 uh, into this, give you some of the background and above all the, the findings. And then I want to move on, on into how Inga Foundation is implementing those findings of maybe, one could say maybe 20 years uh, in Central America, but it's also being repeated, uh, replicated now in 15 other countries. So when I began this, uh, I looked, as many others have done, into the, the, the studies on slash and burn, including, I'm very happy to say, one by Professor Lal. Uh, and one thing became very clear that uh, we were struggling I think everybody was struggling to find a model of sustainability in rainforest environments. And we're going to concentrate today on, on rainforests. Uh, next, next one, please, Annie. Next slide, thanks. This is what's happening uh, in, in tropical forests all around the world. The present estimates are somewhere between 250 to 300 million families uh, attempting to subsist in the tropics as a whole, not, not just rainforests, uh, by burning vegetation. The problem is it's completely unsustainable uh, on every level, but it also depletes soil fertility. We did a, a lot of work into exactly what does happen in soil, and I'm going to tell you a little bit about that. And the, the process is estimated to be firing somewhere between one and two billion tons of carbon into the, into the atmosphere annually. Uh, no one's quite sure because nobody's really sure how many people are uh, subsisting by slash and burn. It is possible that the, in the humid tropics, that's rainforest, there may be a hundred million families, uh, many of whom are doing this. Uh, next, please. As a model of sustainability, uh, there are very there are a few examples in 
indigenous agricultures around the world, leaving aside uh, the, the great transformations of the environment, such as paddy, paddy rice uh, and swamp farming systems, etc. There are really very few examples. And I turned to the forest itself uh, for a model of sustainability. You're looking there at the most productive ecosystem on the planet. Uh, this is actually a watercolor by my friend, Tony Foster, done in Costa Rica. And that ecosystem achieves its productivity on what are probably among the poorest soils on the planet. And there's a very good set of questions to be answered there. Next, please. And here's, a, here's an example of one of the soils. This is Costa Rica. It's called an ultisol uh, in general because it's pretty nearly weathered beyond, it, it's got to the point where it can't really be weathered anymore. You're looking at subsoil here, probably two or three feet below the surface. This is alluvium. And what you're looking at are the remains of a very hard basalt river cobble that has simply been weathered uh, it is so soft, so so weathered that I could actually slice it open with a machete uh, and have that. And next, please. And the one thing that became very clear when I began these studies back in the mid 1980s um, is that a soil like this, this particular one, is in Sarapaki in Costa Rica. It once supported a rainforest of a very high stature, trees up to 50, 60 meters. And the great characteristic that I took away from this, digging small pits into the forest floor, exploring where the roots are, is that the whole fine root concentration of that entire rainforest is concentrated in the top, just few centimeters. There are no traces of major roots down below. Uh, there's no structure in the soil anymore. That's probably weathered to about 25, 30 meters. And we can estimate that this, it's called an ultisol, it's extremely acid. Uh, we can estimate that this is about 30,000 years old from the time when it was deposited in a, a lake river system. It's lost whatever fertility it had, certainly by now and probably halfway through the process, we don't know. But it's on these soils that occupy at least two thirds of the world's humid tropics, what are called the available soils, possibly in Central and South America, the humid zone, 75% of all soils are, are like this, called ultisols and oxisols. And it's sustainable subsistence on soils of this kind that is a big, big problem that we were trying to tackle. Next, please. Uh, you see here um, the results of many decades of repeated slash and burn farming. Uh, this entire landscape was once covered by tropical rainforest. It's been completely replaced now by soil, by, by, by fire climax grasses, invasive grasses that regenerate from rhizomes beneath the soil after the fire has gone through. It's extremely hard uh, getting anything out of these soils this family will be struggling. And back in the 1980s, uh, science could not fully explain what was happening to the fertility of these soils as a result of burning and especially repeat burning. There was considerable agreement about some aspects of soil science, but there was, there was a lot missing. And what came to me, the more I began to explore around it and into it was that I should be looking at the availability of soil phosphorus because that seems to be an untold story and a story with contradiction in it and confusion. And I took a whole lot of soil samples back to Cambridge in uh, 86 and actually was able, was very fortunate and made a couple of breakthroughs that actually paved the way to another study. And by that time, uh, it was being proposed, uh, including by colleagues of Professor Lal at uh, Ibadan in Nigeria, that alley cropping as a technique, an agroforestry technique, might be a sustainable uh, land use that would produce uh, food security. Well, uh, next one, please. 
what I'm going to do now is jump forward and show you this is a result of all those years of, of research and development. This is Inga alley cropping. You're seeing there rows of trees planted very close together, four meters apart between the rows. And the guys are pruning. Uh, once a year this goes on, they're pruning and they're mulching the green material onto the surface of the soil. This is the key process in the sustainability of this system. All the stems and branches will be taken off as domestic firewood. And you, on the left, you can see dark Inga alleys, completely devoid of weeds. Uh, they, are, they will be pruned. And then when the mulch settles, uh, th th this plot will be planted to, uh, I think, maize swept in on, on this occasion. It's a sustainable system. Well, I'll go back to the story now. And next one, please. And uh, in 89, uh, we were very fortunate. We managed to secure some funding from what was then the Commission of the European Communities to carry out a grassroots study. Uh, and with the University of Costa Rica, uh, we uh, slashed and burnt uh, two hectares of lowland secondary rainforest. Uh, so I hope you realize you're being addressed by a, an environmental vandal. Uh, we cleared this and set out uh, some experiments. Next, please. And this is the resulting site, uh, completely clear of all stems. It's flat. It's a very acid soil, a pH of 4.1. And what we've done here is to set out experimental plots. And what you're seeing there is the first baseline crop of maize just developing in the recently uh, slashed and burnt soil. The next piece. Then we had, we tested two hypotheses. One was that alley cropping uh, was a sustainable alternative. The other that phosphorus might be a key part of the story, but I, for other reasons, chose to apply the crude form of rock phosphate, uh, of phosphate as it's mined. This is rock phosphate. So you're seeing there four different treatments on the same soil. Each of those plots is 400 square meters, so they're quite big. They're arranged in groups of four in blocks, and then there were four blocks. And for the local species, uh, well, for the, the, the alley cropping species, I, I listened to a, a certain well-known research establishment who recommended Erythrina and Glarocidia as two to suitable species. And uh, next one, please. And I, I can show you now, uh, this is uh, the experimental site. Uh, I forget how long, two or three years into the experiment. And against their advice, I planted Inga in alley cropping as well. And we ended up with eight species working in collaboration with uh, Terry Pennington at Kew and uh, Nelson Zamora at the Institute of Biodiversity in, uh, in Costa Rica. And uh, th there in the background, but the main experiment was done with uh, Erythrina and Glyrosidia. Uh, next, please. Just to, I, I, I'll try, I'm not going to dwell too much on the science, but uh, just to show you, uh, we, we planted maize and beans at six month rotations, deliberately trying to run down the fertility of the soil and then applying or withholding uh, plant nutrients to see if there'd be a response. And in this case, we're, tr we're testing for a response to cations, that's lime, that's calcium, magnesium, potassium in a sort of cocktail. We put it on, as you can see along the bottom there, uh, zero, 200, four, et cetera, up to 800 kilos per hectare. And what you're seeing there in year four after the burn, uh, there is no response whatever in the beans to these varying levels of the lime. But what you're also seeing in the purple data there, a very clear res response to the rock phosphate that was applied early in the experiment. And more data, uh, next please. Here, for example, you see uh, the production of prunings. This is the, the organic material that's going back into the soil and you can see a massive uh, overproduction of Inga, it outcompeted the recommended Erythrina glurosidia species hugely, but you can see in year two, I don't know, was that five times as much or something. 
And data like these convince us that you know, Inga is a very powerful, very useful tree in this environment. Next, please. And above all, how was the system producing basic grains? These are the basic grains of Central America, maize and beans, the classic ingredients of the diet right through from, well, Aztec times, before pre-Aztec, Olmec times. And one good test of a system is to see how well it can export the limiting nutrient. It turns out that phosphorus was the only limiting nutrient on this experiment. How can it export that limiting nutrient from the soil in the form of, of, of grain, maize and beans? So you're seeing there the control plots, that's just bare soil. Uh, the only organic material it had is the, the slash weeds were left on the surface. And that's in year seven is exporting four kilos of of phosphorus per, uh, per hectare. Inga edulis, one of the great species we use in alley cropping, seven years on is producing at least double without any assistance from minerals, uh, at least double the control. On the right, Inga edulis uh, still uh, benefiting from the rock phosphate is exporting three times as much as the control in the form of basic grain. In other words, food. And it's better quality food because we saw higher phosphorus content in the grain as well as higher yields. So if we're going to talk about and think about sustainability of food production, the basic thing, food security on these really problem soils and these really problem environments, it is data like these that we've had to generate. Uh, next, please. Uh, again, uh, showing how much uh, phosphorus is being returned by the different systems to the soil. There's not much going in the control plots. There's a lot going in several of the Inga species. They're returning it through the, uh, through the mulch that's being applied. And you can see the, how well the Inga is performing there. Uh, more data, which may look a bit confusing, but uh, just to sort of cap it off, so really some extraordinary findings in, this, in the question of soil phosphorus here. Uh, what you're looking at is the amount of phosphorus, the total phosphorus, in three layers of soil, zero to five, five to 10, and 10 to 20 centimeters. All the roots of the cropping system are really in the top five centimeters, maybe down to 10, almost nothing uh, below. And you're seeing there the very the, you know, the the cream yellow data, the top top five centimeters. And what you're seeing there is a huge amount of phosphorus. What you're also see, uh, not seeing is how very little of it is actually available to the crops. So and this is the limiting nutrient that's that's limiting sustainable food production on these soils. And what you're seeing is the total organic, inorganic, living organisms, all the total phosphorus of the soil. Now, we got there the data, the pre-burned data that I got from, we brushed the forest before we felled it. I did the sampling, and for reasons that uh, escaped me, I had 96 uh, soil pits, small ones, uh, to, to sample. The good tight data there. And then we were able to sample again seven weeks after the burn. Now, soil scientists will tell you these soils fix phosphorus. It's a process called sorption. It's a chemical process, physical chemical process, in which the phosphorus is taken up by the clays, the red stuff you saw in that soil profile, and is unavailable to the plants. So we burnt a secondary forest that I estimate had about 200 kilos per hectare of phosphorus in it. That has completely disappeared in a process that soil science was saying, well, it doesn't happen. This will be trapped in the clays in the top of the profile. Well, it's not trapped, it's gone. 200 kilos disappeared within seven weeks. We, will, we don't have data for years, first and second years, but we do have data for year three. Um, there's a, somebody might have a question about that one. But you can see after year three, the total phosphorus of the soil dropping, and it's doing so dramatically. It doesn't look much, but it's there. You're seeing 200 kilos. I recalculated using uh, better uh, soil density data. 
And the total loss to that ecosystem was 360 kilos of phosphorus uh, in five years. That's including the estimate of phosphorus in the uh, forest canopy. Now, a crop of maize will take out uh, somewhere in the region of five kilos. So if we take the 360 loss, that's the equivalent of 72 crops of maize has been lost from the soil. And I sustain, I maintain that these data alone would explain what is driving shifting agriculture in, in these soil types. There are other factors, of course, but this is, this is a major driver. And this gave us the problem we had to crack. So uh, next, please. Yeah. What came out of the Cambridge studies seven years was that the only sustainable system of those we trialed was alley cropping with Inga uh, supplemented by rock phosphate. And well, we turn now to what I would call the so what question. Well, what are we doing with it? And we're now back into closer to the present day. This is Honduras. This is the Cangrejal Valley. Uh, heavily deforested for well over, we discovered later, about 100 years. Extraordinary. And this family have raised five, 6,000 young Inga in a nursery at the bottom of the valley near the stream. And they've carried, they're carrying them up to the only plot that they have available. And they're planting them along the contours, uh, finding the contours with uh, a device called an A-frame. Next, please. And here you see... Uh, in, in the same valley, different plot, Inga edulis uh, beginning to get its head up, beginning to dominate the invasive grasses. Next, please. You can see they're along the contours. And two years into the growth, what you're seeing is the Inga have completely eliminated all the grass. These are very, very pernicious invasive grasses. They're completely killed out by the shade. We don't use any herbicides. This plot is actually on the university campus, experimental plot, is now ready to prune and to plant. Next, please. And here's the process. This is a real situation. Um, the guys are swiping the, uh, the branches and upper stems of the Inga. They're stripping the foliage and mulching it deeply on the soil surface. And they're removing the stems and branches for domestic firewood. And this is the key difference between alley cropping with Inga and alley cropping as first developed in um, uh, IITA in, in Baden. There, I think, they were using small leaved legumes. And the idea was that the foliage should decompose uh, in time for the nutrients that are released from that decomposition to be taken up by the crop. I threw that out completely. And what we've done here is to say, put on tough recalcitrant mulch it will take a, quite a while to decompose and simulate the conditions of the forest floor. And what that's doing is giving physical protection. The, the ferocity of the sun uh, in the middle of the day in, in Honduras is tremendous. And its ability to cook soil, exposed soil, is tremendous. So one of the first things that's happening here is the Inga foliage is protecting the surface soil from drying out, from desiccation and overheating. And moreover, it's, it's conserving moisture. I'll come to that in a bit. It turned out to be extremely important. Next, please. Here's uh, one of the pilot um, project uh, plots from the days of the Cambridge study. It's only a tenth of a hectare here just to test the system with uh, local farmers. This is in the buffer zone of the Pico Bonito National Park. And I think it's about 10 days after the pruning operation. And you can see the mulch has settled a bit and it's gone pale. That will be reflecting solar energy straight back into the space, uh, will not be heating the soil. You can just see tiny seedlings of maize pushing through the mulch. No weeds can do that. They're too small and they, they don't have the reserves. And you can also see the mass of firewood that that guy is taking off. He said to get even that amount would take him three weeks, got to hire a mule, 
He'll go up into the into the national park and cut understory trees. It would have taken him three weeks. This was produced 200 meters from his kitchen door, where it's going to be used. Next, please. And here we go. The the, the, the maize is growing. There are very few weeds. The inga's recovering. Next, please. Uh, here, the maize is ready to go. It's doubled over. It can be harvested at any time. And you can see the inga on each side is now recovering. That will be left to completely close over the canopy. Uh, nine months later, the whole process is repeated. Following year, they can, they can prune and mulch and plant again. It's a sustainable system. Next, please. And it's a bit more than that. It's also resilient, as we've been discovering. This is the Kangrahal River in uh, March 2016, when we had the, the biggest rainstorm since Hurricane Mitch in 98, when 195 millimeters of rain fell in uh, 18 hours. Seeing there as the river's come up 40 feet and is very nearly taking out the bridge. But what that storm did was to rip off the hillsides all of the conventional slash and burn crops, mainly beans at that time of the year. And this event was then followed by four months of intense drought and intense heat. Next, please. And by the time we were able to struggle back up to the, uh, our demonstration farm, we found that none of the plants had been hurt no soil had been lost. The full force of the rain had been absorbed by the mulch. And because there's a lot of organic matter in the soil, that rainwater was able to percolate in and it caused no erosion. The beans went on to flower and to produce a crop, even though not a drop of rain fell after that storm. Next, please. Same with the maize. This is the demo farm. No damage whatsoever, no soil loss. Next, please. They went on to produce certainly a, a diminished crop. We would have hoped for more than that. But the point we make now is that a family with this system, with this incredible violence that they're now experiencing through El Nino events, that family would not have starved. Uh, we would want better yields, but they would, have, they would have been able to eat. Next, please. One discovery we, we made is that in these uh, particular soils, uh, to our astonishment, we <coughs> learned that the first forest clearance was about 100 years ago. And we then found that this system did respond to the cation mixture that um, had, not, had not produced a response in the Cambridge study. So this is dolomitic lime and KMAG in mixture being spread. Normally, we now do it at the, at the time of planting. These systems responded phenomenally to the, uh, the, the mineral mix now, which is rock phosphate, dolomitic lime, and KMA. Next, please. And it's made such a difference that instead of having to wait two years to produce a crop, uh, actually you can, well, we would normally recommend beans because they wouldn't compete with the main. You can see the developing Inga there. Uh, at the same time that it, the, the tiny trees were planted, this guy chose to put in some maize, which actually would have shaded the inga a bit, but it doesn't matter. And he produced a crop in a soil that he said is completely sterile. It would produce nothing. And it's growing the inga and it's produced him a crop. So we've got a system there that is really feeding people. Next, please. And we basically have got an answer to the question of food security in basic grains. The next component of a four component integrated model is the same system, but managed differently for cash crops so that the family will have an income. Here's an example of organic pineapples. Uh, next please. Probably the best example, this is up on the farm. Uh, this is pepper grown on living trees as supports, uh, interplanted with turmeric. They've also got a couple, they've got a few plants of plantain in there as well. This is a very profitable crop for a family. It, it, it can totally transform the family economy. Uh, so that's the second component, uh, cash crops grown within the Inga system. Next, please. The third component is Inga combined with fruit trees. Uh, cacao is the best example, but 
avocados, citrus, and others uh, can be grown in combination. The inga is the only source of nitrogen for that system, and the farmers never need to buy any uh, fertilizer. And we're just taking a hypothetical uh, average eight hectare holding here and saying that what they're doing is rotating slash and burn at the moment, and we'll see what putting in the system will do. Next, please. And there, again, hypothetically, two hectares of Inga alleys, a hectare of Inga with fruit trees, and the remaining five hectares then taken out of the slash and burn cycle and planted with valuable timber, which in 25, 30 years time will uh, send the grandchildren to college and keep the farmer in a secure old age. Uh, next, please. And sort of this is how we see it uh, at landscape level. Um, in fact, the plantings are very much denser than are shown there. People are wanting a lot more Inga alleys. They're wanting to rotate twice a year with them and a lot more fruit because the cacao is, we, we, I think we've distributed 400,000 um, grafted or hybrid top quality Trinitario uh, cacao to the families. Uh, next, please. Here's an example of the reforestation. Uh, we bought some extra land for an arboretum on the demo farm. And you can just see it's been planted with, it's actually two species of Inga. And then when they start to recapture the site from the grass, we will plant uh, valuable timber and mahoganies, rosewoods, etc. And next, please. Three years on, that's the same slope. Uh, and you probably think you're looking at a forest. Uh, you're actually looking at an agroforest. Uh, it's taken from a slightly different angle. And in time, the timber trees will push through the canopy and they will ultimately dominate. Uh, they'll probably kill off the inga. But in any case, we're going to be thinning the canopy a bit to let light through into the cacao, which is underneath. But that is a productive agroforestry system. Next, please. Oh, what I should say is just where the, those two ladies were seen descending the slope, there was a patch of damp soil that now is a flowing spring. And I personally am astonished that just 40, 50 meters of trees on the slope above is enough to bring a, a spring back into, into flow. And it's permanent. It, it, it doesn't dry up. And we're getting a lot of reports from the farmers of the same thing happening, that water is clean water is starting to flow uh, underneath these uh, Inga systems. So the model in summary is in the middle at the top there you've got uh, one of the Petch Meyer farmers uh, completely dwarfed by Creole maize. He's got a first crop on that plot for ages. There's below him another example of a cash crop is vanilla grown on supports uh, in the Inga alleys. Very valuable crop left you've got well i put citrus in there it's a bad photograph but you can grow citrus with inga coming up you see the domestic firewood ready to be used far right that's the experimental biological corridor that we planted at Kula at the university and those trees are three years into recapturing they succeeded in recapturing the site from these two species of very aggressive invasive grass and I've included the one on the bottom right as this system is providing environmental services, clean water. And that's uh, actually my favorite swimming hole on the Rio Corinto uh, draining Pico Benito National Park. Next, please. Uh, we've got a carbon model for what the family is doing. This is one family on that theoretical, hypothetical eight hectares. Uh, uh, they are starting from zero, well, from negative because they're slashing and burning. And they're planting timber trees uh, starting a hectare a year from year two. And by year 10, which is uh, where we are at the moment, they're avoiding sequestering about 150 tons of carbon a year. And, and is th th these, this sequestration will go on for another 100 years because when they cut the timber it's still sequestered carbon. Next please. We've got the model two for the Land for Life project and this is based on the assumption of 
uh, recruiting 40 families a year starting in 2012. Uh, we're in year 10 of the program. And according to the model, we will have sequestered or avoided 450,000 tons of actually CO2 uh, by the end of, of this year. And that's a number that will be uh, rising again for a very long period of time. Next, please. Final thing, uh, you're looking there at uh, a picture I stole. Uh, that's the, the Pico Bonito National Park on the right. It's a protected rainforest. The, the forest reserve of Texiguat on the left. This is the Cordillera where we're working. And the forest link between uh, those two forest bodies was broken about 20 years ago. So they're genetically isolated now. But the extraordinary thing was the community that actually did that came to us uh, 18 months ago, asking for the system. They were absolutely unanimous, 31 families up at this place called Betania, you see there, uh, who now want to adopt the whole system. And if we succeed in this, we could restore the link between Pico Bonito and Texigua. And we think that might be the first time it's ever been done in Central America, in which isolated forest blocks have been reconnected not with rainforest, but with agroforest, which from a wildlife point of view uh, is just the same. Next one, please. <clears throat> Thank you for, for listening. I hope I haven't taken too long. Mike, thank you so much for that wonderful talk. And now uh, we welcome uh, Professor Lal to have a conversation with you, get his thoughts on your work and hear what you have to say in return. Uh, thank you very much. It was a great pleasure listening to excellent presentation and <clears throat> reminding me of uh, uh, things that I had experienced and worked with in Africa since uh, 70. A um, lot of uh, good new information. I'm not very knowledgeable about phosphorus, so learned many new things about it. And at the end, especially on carbon sequestration, the number, I took a note, 160 ton per hectare over 12 year period, that's about 15, 14 tons per year. That's a very impressive number. So I like to have some explanation on that later. But uh, first, um, very briefly, phosphorus fixation. Is that uh, you about harvesting four kilogram of phosphorus per hectare in grains? Is that primarily recycling by Inga roots from deeper layers? Where is that phosphorus coming from? No, the, the four kilos was from the control plots, which okay. were just bare soil. Okay. And what would happen is twice a year that would be slashed back and the residues left on the plot. So the, uh, the, the beans, the, the maize and beans together were only able to export four kilos. Okay. But you were looking in the Inga system that had uh, one application of rock phosphate. Uh, this is seven years after the start of the experiment. So it's been producing crops for that whole period of time. It was, it was exporting three times as much, 12 kilos okay. Okay. per hectare per year. But that came oh, yeah. from rock phosphate, then are from also from recycling from deeper layers? It's from recycling, but I don't know if it's coming up from deeper layers because in the, on that site, almost all the fine roots were concentrated in the top five centimeters. Yeah, you and, uh, in a study I did, uh, mm. actually about 30% of them, of the fine roots were out of the soil altogether and into the base of the mulch. Mm. So, I don't, it's certainly not recycling from depth. I mean, what we find at depth is, is, is almost a sort of phosphorus desert. There's a lot there, but none of it's available. So I think, I think it's, I think where it's coming from is the microbial biomass, okay. uh, which is benefiting from the organic matter put in by the Inga. Oh, very nice. <clears throat> I got, um... I'm very impressed with your figure you showed 195 millimeter rainfall 
and no erosion on that very steep slope. So yeah. that is definitely yeah. a very plus part. And with no erosion, with all that ground cover, you stabilize uh, the soil yeah. and uh, no runoff. So obviously no drought then uh, either. You crop look very well, although you mentioned quite a few times drought situation. Yeah. So uh, yeah. there was most water was being conserved and yeah. not being lost as runoff. Yes. But another thing that you mentioned was um, intense heat. So yes. I was hoping that you might have some data on soil temperature under Inga mulch versus a bare ground, for example. Yes, I do. Have. Did you have some data on that one? Yes. Um, the, it was on, on the experimental plots in uh, San Juan in Costa Rica. Okay. Uh, I was taking soil temperatures in the forest uh, before we did the operation. Uh, and it was 28, 28, 29, 29, 28. It just Andringa. didn't, yeah, in the, in the rainforest under the shelter. Okay. Uh, once we'd, in the middle of the day, uh, I think it was uh, in May 89, the soil temperature uh, fully exposed. Uh, I made a small heap of soil, put the thermometer in, shaded it, 59. <laughs> yes. And... Uh, under the Inga mulch, 28. Yeah. Consistent, that's, that's 28. Very, yeah. very remarkable. Excuse uh, Mike, me, one, one second. Yeah. <clears throat> Mike, could you translate that into Fahrenheit? Because most of our listeners <laughs> are, are Fahrenheiters. <laughs> Joe, I don't know if I could. I, mean, somebody well, I, can, I can do that. 50 could. degrees Celsius would be five uh, in terms of Fahrenheit would be 90 plus 32, 122. Yeah. yeah. So and uh, so thirty degrees Celsius uh, would 86. be 50, 86 yeah. Fahrenheit. Yeah. yeah. So that's a big difference. I had very similar data about thirty Celsius under mulch tree crop, uh, Lucina, and yes. about fifty five sixty on heap. Uh, yeah. Very correct. And that can yeah. make a big difference whether a seedling is going to grow or. Yes. Kind of die, you know. Yeah. And uh, in a maize, yeah. uh, corn, the growing point of uh, corn is very close to about uh, one inch of the soil surface for about four to six weeks. Yeah. So a growing point suffering a temperature of 50s and 60s or yeah. even uh, mid 40s uh, can have a very detrimental impact. And so that yeah. information. Uh, yeah. can also be very, very useful. Yeah. The other part I wanted to mention was, um, you said your soils were ultisols. Ultisols. I, I think uh, ultisols, yeah. Mostly yeah. ultisols. And uh, yeah. In, yeah. see, this is a difference between Western Africa and uh, Central and South America. Yes. Soils of Central and South America, and Pedro Sanchez uh, and many other people have shown the same that phosphorus is a serious issue because the soils are highly weathered. You mentioned that, ultisol and oxisol. But in Africa, the soils are elfi soils. Yes. Yeah. And they do not have as much phosphorus fixation problem as yeah. the ultisol and oxisols have. Yeah. So a few yeah. kilogram per hectare, few pounds per acre, yeah. kilogram per hectare the same as pounds per acre, of phosphor, I think we were using 26, 20 yes. BT Kang, uh, yes. he always recommended about 20. So I think yes. that difference need to be pointed out. High fixation yes. capacity of oxysols and ultisols rather yes. than of alpha yes. which, yes. is, which is a very important factor. Yes. Um, um, I also wanted to uh, ask you some more clarification about your two hypotheses. Yes. Your one hypothesis was alley cropping is success, which you, you showed, <laughs> you shown that. It yeah. was, and B.T. Kang and George Wilson and others, uh, be it Okibo in Africa, uh, had a very same conclusion. Your second, that the P is the key factor, uh, I agree for alphysol and oxysol, that is also. I think yeah. there might have been a third hypothesis your data would have proven, and that is that the forest uh, would sequester carbon and uh, more so than um, 
uh, grain crops and would uh, eventually over a long period of time be a climate solution. You mean uh, into the soil? Both in soil and vegetation. Yes. Apparently the data yes. you showed 160 ton of carbon over 12 years, that was okay. mostly vegetation. Yes, um, that's, uh, that's assuming an eight hectare holding and assuming yeah. the family um, adopts at a very sort of steady rate of um, planting a hectare per year from, I think it's the second year, I've forgotten that. I, I did the model, but it's from year two, I think. Yeah. And th those are the data of pure carbon, not, not CO2. I, it's then, a carbon, not CO2 yeah. carbon. I, th I think I'd, I'd have one comment. The, I mean, of course, developing secondary forest, of course, is sequestering yeah. carbon, atmospheric carbon. There is a definite limit, uh, and it's really, I, I, I need to talk to David Polson again. There's a definite limit as to how much can be sequestered into soil uh, uh, up to the point where you reach equilibrium and, and whatever organic matter you're putting in is simply decomposed mm -hmm. and going straight back into the atmosphere. You can't, I mean, in, in other words, we're not looking at peat soils that just go on getting deeper and deeper. I, I, I agree with David Paulson yeah. that there is a limit. Yeah. Uh, and yeah. In fact, uh, uh, the limit is, uh, you know, I always give example of a container and you can put only a certain amount of water back in a container. And yes. that is um, essentially how much you have consumed before. Correct. And that's yes. what you can put in. But yes. I was hoping that you might show some data because you uh, did cover quite a lot of vegetation you yeah. stopped erosion, so you had a biomass carbon of 160 ton of carbon. So there must be some carbon gone in soil. Oh yeah, and they, that carbon. model How includes. It? it includes. I, I can't tell you off the top of my head, but the model okay. it, it includes carbon that's been sequestered into a very degraded soil. Yes. And what I yes. did was I took David Polson's data from Yuri Marguas, been okay. working there with Pedro Sanchez yes. Yes. and others. And I reversed it and I said, well, okay, I think w when we're putting this amount of material in, we'll probably go up to about, uh, I think, reach equilibrium in about 12 years. So okay. that was the only thing I could do was take David's yeah, hypothesis, yeah, yeah. Uh, what is it? No, it's actually ob <clears throat> observations and reverse it. That, that's how the soil data got in. Okay. But it's a complete model. Right, right. Uh, it's not just, it's not just uh, biomass. Yeah, I so, think uh, that. I, I hate. Uh, yeah, sorry. I'm sorry, I hate to interrupt because <laughs> uh, this is a great conversation, but yeah. there were several questions about doing this kind of agroforestry in different regions of the world from north to south. And Mike, I'm wondering if, if you have any generalizations that are applicable to other environments and um, yeah, different elevations. Yeah. Okay. Um, well, Inga, I mean, there, there are many, many legumes, thousands of legume tree species. Inga is a remarkable genus. It contains well over 300, I think it's about 350 species of Inga within the single genus. And they are thought to have um, originated uh, in the Amazon basin. Um, we've seen no equivalents. I've worked with Q. There's something quite similar in Southeast Asia, which is going to be useful, Archidendron. But unfortunately, we're not seeing anything in Africa. Perhaps Miletia will work. But the point is this, uh, if you'd asked me the question about four or five years ago, I'd have said, well, Inga is certainly the species we're using are very much trees of the rainforest. They're forest gap species that uh, are from rainforest and they probably won't tolerate much drought. But I can tell you that the, last year, we had the longest drought ever recorded in Central America, it was seven months. We had cases, sorry, 2019, not 20. And we have cases of families who planted, pruned and planted their Inga and grew not only beans, but maize right through without a single drop of rain falling on the crop. We've got a, maybe 20 cases. And it's a very consistent story. 
that there was enough moisture uh, conserved beneath the mulch to do that. Now, all of the plots in question were probably four or five years old, so they'd accumulated a lot of soil organic matter. But the Inga, um, I think about five months, four to five months into the drought, defoliated. And I thought we were going to lose a you know, quarter of a million trees. And no, it started raining in September. And they came back. And in the December, the families pruned and planted. It was extraordinary. So the, the, we, we, we're working with, the, the, it's being replicated in 15 other humid tropical countries, but there's also somebody trying it in Uganda, uh, which is not humid tropics. And- um, Well, actually we're, we're hearing this, this kind of story from many people who are working in regenerative agriculture practice. Yeah. I mean, Gabe Brown is in North Dakota and mm. he's observing the same things weeks or months of drought, but the sto soil retains its moisture because it's so well covered and rooted and the yeah. microbiology, et cetera, and so forth that makes up a healthy yeah. soil is all yeah. active. Yeah, yeah. So another yeah. question, um, let me see. Um, hmm. um, a question about how the springs came back. I think that's yeah. related to what we were just saying, when the yeah. water infiltrates, the water table rises, and is that what you would say relates to your experience? No, um, I don't know you can talk about a water table on those slopes. Um, what astonished me is that uh, we're only talking two or three years after the, the um, talking about our own um, arboretum, it's only between two and three, I think three years, probably fair, uh, after we put trees onto that uh, very degraded pasture. And what is happening, I'm sure, I'm sure Professor Lull would have a lot more to say about this, is that during that period, the leaf litter is be being incorporated into the soil mass, actually by earthworms mainly, but it, of course all the decomposers are there, fungi and bacteria and so on. But the organic matter is is accumulating and that's acting as a sponge uh, which is doing two things it's stopping incident rainwater from running through the profile and it's releasing it slowly afterward but what astonishment we knew that you know the mulching systems improve soil moisture we knew that um, many studies have shown it but i was astonished to actually see a spring running permanently and reliably after only three years, and with only about 50 meters of trees on the slope above it. And we're getting consistent stories from farmers. There's one uh, right now who's saying it's, he, he, he takes joy from going and sort of up into the Inga and lying down and listening to the birds, falling asleep on, on, the, on, the, on the, uh, the litter. And he says, in answer to the question, no, I'm not gonna prune them this year. Why not? Well, because I've got three springs, clean water, and I'm frightened that I'm going to lose them. And I, I, we knew it was good, but I didn't realize this could happen on such a relatively small area. He's got clean water. I, actually, he won't lose those springs because it's the soil organic matter, I think, that's, that's, that's doing that. But he's going to take some convincing. Um, here's a question <clears throat> about what role uh, did indigenous or traditional knowledge play in the develop, development of the system, of the Inga system? I was, I started with a, an inquiry among slash and burn farmers. I, I mean, with the literature, for example, with indigenous um, slash and burn in, let's say, South America, um, in, in the Amazon, the main staple crop there is uh, manioc, it's called in Africa, cassava. Uh, it's a, a basically starch. Uh, it, to, to, to me, it's ghastly. I really don't like it. Um, but that's the main energy source. But traditionally, that would have been supported by fishing and hunting for the protein. Manioc has no, no protein in it to speak of. It's just pure starch. It, it's in West Africa, it is a cause of serious malnutrition in kids. 
They have huge yeah. bellies filled with this, and there is no protein there, and probably no minerals either. Um, um, I don't think that answers the question fully, but uh, I did a social inquiry to sort of learn, but I, I have to say, I felt that what was needed was a revolutionary approach. There is one question mark I have, is not quite sure, but we it's possible that the Maya were using trees as mulch. There's one of the Inga related species, it's called Maya Maya, and we found it extremely useful. It's actually not an Inga, but it's the, it, it's, it's very close botanically. It's possible they were using that in their swamp systems. Hmm. It's also possible they're using it on dry, but no one knows. So there are also a couple of questions about biochar. Have, and this is for both you and Professor Lal. Yeah. Um, have you seen yeah. an opportunity for applying biochar? <laughs> if you went to one of the farmers who's poverty stricken, uh, owns nothing but the clothes he stands up in and the machete, and you suggested to him that he cuts all the inga down, goes to the huge trouble of turning it into charcoal, then grinding it up, and then incorporating it in soil, you would leave that encounter wearing the machete. <laughs> they will not do it. And I wouldn't even dream of suggesting it. You know, the people who advocate this uh, quote terra preta soils, you know, the, the, these extremely fertile soils, they contain a lot of carbon. There is a natural explanation, I don't have time to go into it, as to why those exist. I do not believe that, anthro that, that they've been made by human uh, impact. They are natural. I'm, I'm going to get death threats for this, but I think they're natural. And the proposition. Well, as, as long that, as you don't get any death. Yeah, but I mean, you, you, how deep are you going to put this? You know, you turn over uh, 10 centimeters of soil on a hectare and you've got a thousand tons of material. Yeah, you're going to do that? You suggest that to a guy? You're going to turn over a thousand tons of soil to uh, incorporate this pointless carbon. The carbon goes into the soil through decomposition. Okay. Um, Sorry about that. <laughs> du duly, duly noted. Uh, uh, Ratan, do you have anything to add to that? Oh, no, I think I agree. <clears throat> the uh, biochar have been proven useful as a source of nutrient uh, in a infertile tropical soils, uh, experimental small plots are in a greenhouse study. But I agree, unless... Uh, there's a, some waste material that you can convert to biochar, coconut shell, maybe uh, oil palm shells, uh, some other material that you could generate energy uh, as a material uh, benefit. And then whatever is left, you could use as a biochar as an amendment. So the main idea was to generate clean energy from it. And then byproduct of that was biochar. That kind of system is possible, but intentionally burning, cutting trees and burning them, uh, that is out of question. Um, let's see. I'm sorry, I did want to say something about indigenous knowledge. BT Kang, who developed uh, alley cropping system in Nigeria, uh, he was originally from Indonesia, native of Indonesia. And he brought the native system from Indonesia on hill slope agriculture to use in Africa as alley cropping. So Lucina, or Lucina. Lucina yeah. Yeah. Uh, based, yeah. yeah that, uh, well, Lucina was a native <laughs> of Hawaii, but the concept of using uh, trees on the contour hedges to control yeah. erosion and create natural terraces was practiced in Southeast Asia where he came from yeah. by indigenous farming systems. Yeah. The, the irony is that Lucina is a Central American legume yeah, yeah, and it was introduced and is regarded in the Philippines, as far as I understand, as, a, as an invading weed and as it a is nuisance. Very invasive, yes. Yeah, very um, very... like acacia mangum, but yeah, yeah. Uh, that, that's and why I understand. And the is not invasive, it doesn't uh, yeah. shatter seeds, so it's yeah. yeah. Very good. Uh, I just interrupted, so yeah. please go ahead. Yeah, uh, Just as a 
change of pace. Uh, and we're very concerned about young people these days. We should always be, of course, but in particular yeah. now. Yeah. Uh, question, if we as younger people have some practical experience in agroforestry, how do you recommend we get into agroforest development in a more professional way? Specialists, generalists? Wow. I could, wow. I, I don't think I can answer that. It, it depends. Are you proposing to practice it or are you proposing to uh, become a professional in it? I don't know. I think you've got to train uh, in, in forestry, soils, if you're going to do that. But uh, I, I think I'm going to use the question slightly differently. Um, in in uh, one of the communities that we work with, uh, called Los Limpios, there are roughly 50 families. Among them are a bunch of young guys, 11 in number, who had either taken the decision that they were going to become Mojado, they were going to go to the United States. They were desperate. We have the testimony of one man also who just having been shown the system, realized he got a future in his own place with his own family, didn't. They, they, they said, we've changed our mind. We're not going in the caravanes to, uh, to, the, to the United States. Trump has wasted his money on that wall, whereas <laughs> if he put it into agroforestry in Central America, uh, they wouldn't have a reason to leave and they would bring up the local economy and they would re-green and we'd soak up a lot of carbon. Um. Okay, I, I want to point out to people that um, Mike has written a, a recent paper on his work is published in a journal of the Royal Society. And I'm going to put the link to that article, that paper in the chat for anyone who cares to look at it. I highly recommend it. And in it, he, he cites um, Professor Lal as saying in his latest paper that, um, let me see if I get, get the quote right there. Um, he says that the cumulative technical potential of carbon sequestration at 178 gigatons in soil and 155 gigatons in vegetation between 2020 and 2100 can create a drawdown of atmospheric carbon dioxide by 157 parts per million. Now, we haven't even caught up to that 157 parts per million yet, although we're trying. Uh, uh, Professor Lau, would you care to, to uh, 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 address that? Yes, certainly. Uh, somebody had asked us a question that how much carbon can be sequestered in trees and soil? And, uh, the data that Mike presented today, uh, 12, 15 ton of carbon in biomass uh, is much, much higher than what we use uh, in estimating on a global scale uh, for 155 gigaton between now and 2100. So we use somewhere between one ton and one and a half ton, half a ton of carbon in biomass per hectare and probably one tenth of a ton, half a ton, one third of a ton in soil. And uh, we took all the soils of the world, all the degraded hills you said, remember you said young people, how will they get involved? So I was reminded of lower Himalayas, all the way from Afghanistan to Cambodia, completely denuded hill over the last five, six decades. If the young people were to be trained in agroforestry and afforestation, that would be a solution to overcome drought, flood. We, we saw that problem. So uh, those estimates were actually much lower level than what Mike presented today. So uh, 150 parts per million comes from uh, two ton, two gigaton of carbon uh, taken out, uh, roughly translate to half a uh, ton uh, in uh, part per million of CO2. Uh, that is where that number comes from. But many times people think, can that solve the climate? Absolutely not. Because the maximum potential on an annual basis we came up with was two and a half gigaton of carbon per year. And at the moment, the fossil fuel combustion is 11 and a half gigaton per year. 
and deforestation and biomass burning, Mike also mentioned more than one. So we are burning 12. Out of that under ideal condition, the maximum you can put back is about two and a half gigaton, which is about 20% of the total anthropogenic emissions under ideal conditions. We are nowhere near that. So I just wanted to put things in perspective. If I may add to that perspective a little bit, we are seeing results in all kinds of um, different regenerative situations. And there are people like, well, of course, Gabe Brown again, but there's also David Johnson, who's a soil scientist and microbiologist at New Mexico State, who has developed a system of composting, which adds fungi to the soils and increases the fungal bacterial ratio. And he is talking about five to 10 tons per acre per year with massively increased productivity uh, above ground as well. So it's like if you read the stories of you know, 500 years ago and people, the Europeans came to the United States and marveled how you could walk across rivers on the backs of fish, which we can't do that anymore. But the potential for all of these things is there. And that's what we're working now, for. Um, Adam, those numbers, uh, I salute farmers who can get five to six tons per year in a soil. And I even salute Mike for his 12 to 15 ton of carbon in the biomass. Uh, those are very large number. I have never monitored myself anything closer to that. Um, in biomass, I think we take one to two ton uh, on a global scale, a uh, good number. In soil, we would take a half a ton to one ton of carbon uh, per hectare, not per yeah. acre, as a very good number. So farmers who can sequester five ton, Dave Brent, including another, I salute them, two-handed. I'm glad that they can do that. But I have not, in my 50 years of experience, come closer to monitoring those numbers uh, that they are talking about. My numbers are half a ton per hectare, at the most one ton per hectare in soil, in tree biomass, including alley cropping, one to two ton in the biomass uh, on an average for a large scale. And if he can do that, that's a tremendous amount already. Yeah. But in spite of that, uh, the climate solution really lies in uh, finding non fuel fossil fuel source and then adding carbon in soils and trees, correct? Yes, I agree with that. Okay. Yeah. So, Mike, do you have any uh, closing words? Oh, well, it's a huge pleasure to, to meet Professor Lau and Mike. Um, they're really wonderful. Um, I just wanted to say the, the data I produced for the single family uh, assumes an eight hectare holding. Yeah, uh, not, we're not talking uh, Small huge way. numbers per, per hectare. Yeah. It, so this is per holding per family. Okay. Um, yes, uh, yeah. yes. Okay. Yeah. It, and it comes to the same as one to two ton per hectare biomass carbon. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I mean, just to say, I mean, we, we, we started this program 12 years ago, well, sorry, 2012. And I just been incredibly knocked out by just the numbers of people now asking for this system. We, we have hundreds and hundreds and we, we at the moment we, we lack the resources to put the boots on the ground to make it happen but it was a slow start this is a revolutionary idea you take to you go to a farmer and say or he says to you you know my kids are hungry you're telling me to grow trees my kids don't eat trees and they're not saying that anymore uh, they're saying yeah we like the system they also saying they love the firewood it's a favorite domestic firewood once, once it's dry, which it, it, it dries very quickly. It's very light wood. And the, the, they, they love it. It doesn't produce much smoke. Uh, so things like that, uh, uh, it, it's, a, it's a great success. And, and we've got, the, I think, the best team in the world out there uh, now extending it, implementing it. And it is suddenly, suddenly, I think, because it's surviving these 
huge El Nino events of the past few years, and they're going to become more commonplace. Um, I think that's one of the reasons why we, we are suddenly inundated with demand. They're seeing people take crops when they themselves have failed uh, through drought or, or, or flood. I think I'll stop there. Okay, thank you so much, yeah. Professor Lal. And I think we can call you Professor, <laughs> Professor Hans with an honorary, <laughs> an honorary professor <laughs> uh, granted by our authority is biodiversity for a livable climate. <laughs> thank you. And thanks to our audience and to GBH and to our, our two most honorable guests. My pleasure. Bye-bye. <laughs>